and for those of you who haven't met Sophia Vargas, I'm here to talk about valuation models and how we can apply them to open source. I guess I need to be a little bit closer ooh, to this for the live stream. Okay, so I have to be tethered. Um, and as Kaylee mentioned, I also spend a lot of time with the chaos community talking about metrics. And I, I feel like the core of my role is figuring out how to measure stuff, um, which can be a hard problem and sometimes an interesting problem and a problem that I'm going to bring to this room today. So this is kind of a weird talk for me because I, as a wannabe researcher, I'm not gold on publication. Uh, and so I get to share half-baked ideas uh, in the hopes that I can learn from the folks in this room and discover more ideas to consider. So this question came from being asked this question, uh, where people are struggling to ascribe value to the work that they do or to ascribe open source value to open source in general, say, how do we know why we should be contributing to a project, either people or funding? Uh, what impact does that contribution have on the project, on the ecosystem, at the company? Um, and maybe more tangibly, if you're a maintainer and you're trying to figure out how to justify continuing to work on a project on behalf of your company, um, you might need to demonstrate this in a more concrete fashion than just, I think it's the right thing to do, um, which may have worked in the past, but in an increasingly resource constrained environment, that argument might not be good enough anymore. Uh, so I've been saying, how do we ascribe value? Um, and I want to recognize that there are many we's, uh, especially when you think about something like value, which is very subjective. I have different values than other people around me um, and that other communities have, that other organizations have. Um, and so I recognize that there's a lot of different personas potentially at play here. Um, I'm going to be focusing a little bit more on the persona of the corporation um, because they have a lot of money that could be going into open source. Um, but I will kind of be exploring a couple of different personas as well. So I'll probably try to be specific about who I'm talking about um, versus just saying something like, we, these are also my cats. Um, so uh, I was a little inspired this morning in the keynote uh, to talk about aspirational goals. Why am I trying to do this? Um, it's because I have a theory. Um, I don't even want to call it a hypothesis yet because it's really an aspirational theory. But if we can appropriately quantify value of open source work, then we can adequately invest in it. And you can kind of see my ulterior motive here. I want to ensure that corporations like the one that I work for continue to contribute both people and funding into open source communities um, so that we can sustain these ecosystems. But to make that argument have more weight, it would be great if I could demonstrate this. And companies love numbers. So what can we measure today? Um, I want to mention that I'm not the only person who's been thinking about this problem. Um, this is a call out to uh, Bob Kellen's talk uh, earlier this year at KubeCon. Uh, he called it, why is this so hard conveying business value of open source? Um, and he really focuses on the individual practitioner, helping them to communicate to their manager, to their business, why they're doing the work that they do. Um, and his argument really focuses on ensuring you have the right data um, and also how you communicate this, how you talk about it, what are the kinds of words you use. Um, I do feel bad. I am in a room of academics and the way that I've uh, written all my sources is not actually the right format. So I apologize for that, but I was trying to be a little descriptive in both the title, giving credit to the person as well as the publications. So you should have all the information on the screen. It's just not in any particular format recognized by a governing body. So I wanted to explore the models that already exist and see what we could learn from them and see how we could build and improve upon them. Starting first with software development models. Where can we, how can we learn about value assessment through them? Um, anyone in the room heard of Kokomo? Uh, this was an old one, uh, 1981, uh, initially posited by Boehm um, as the constructive cost model to estimate person month time to get from zero to state of code base. Um, there's been a couple of iterations on this, you can see, but even the last version was in 20, 2000. So when I started asking people I knew in the software development productivity research space, some people were like, yeah, I heard about that. That's really old. Uh, and other people were like, I've never heard of that. So I was like, well, that's interesting. Fun fact, it has been used in an open source context before. Um, in fact, this model for understanding the total amount of work it took to build the Kubernetes project at this point in time, um, someone created a project calculator cost calculator using the Kokomo model. So we've seen it apply to open source. Did this actually help move anyone's needle? I'm not really sure. Um, but clearly, there's a huge estimated cost value. So it clearly caught someone's eye. It's a really big number. Um, so clearly, we've tried to use this in the past. Is this an effective model? Should we consider using it again? I took a little a closer look at the methodology itself. At the core of it, the Kokomo bottle is, sorry, I should have written this out, LOC, lines of code. Um, sorry, you're looking at my shorthand notes. 
and I made some slides real fast. Um, and, but in addition to looking at lines of code as the core quantitative metric, uh, it also looks at the complexity of the task. Um, and if you read into the model itself, it actually starts to baseline different types of tasks and grades them on their level of complexity. So you use that as a multiplier, not only looking at lines of code, but also how hard was the thing to do, and maybe we should add more hours to harder tasks. Um, more advanced versions of the model include more types of context multipliers, say trying to think what the thing is. Is it related to hardware? Is it a personal? Is it a project attribute? Um, and then in later versions of the Kokomo model, they also include the concept of software reuse and looking at adaptation costs to incorporate it into your code base. So this is somewhat sophisticated for what it was. Granted, all of the multipliers were actual numbers generated by baselines in the 1980s. So I think software development has significantly changed since then. Uh, so we probably can't use these anymore, but I think it's a really cool approach at the time, um, but it's still sorely deficient in one context. This is actually, um, I'll call him out here, a direct quote from Bob Kellen, who was also looking at this and also a member of the Kubernetes project, so was thinking a lot about how this has been used in the past for that project. Um, but Kokomo model does not take into account history or diffs. That means if you refactor your code base and it ends up smaller, then it, it would come out as a lower cost to create it. And that is, in fact, wrong because you spent more time on it to refactor it and make it better. So clearly there's some deficiency. So it presented a cool idea, but probably not the best valuation of software in the last long open source. Um, another model that I'm looking at in terms of software development while we're on the topic uh, is the DOOR project that was started by Nicole Forsgren um, and other researchers at Google and other places. Um, actually, I don't think it was other Google. I think it was actually Puppet and others, um, I want to say. <laughs> And it essentially was designed to measure the effectiveness of software development teams. So not necessarily software development the asset, but software development the process. Um, and following the progression of this, their method has changed over time and they've evolved it. They had a big survey and tried to baseline different software development styles and practices. Um, the project or iteration that caught me was in 2020, they came out with the four key metrics or four keys project, which were ways that we could assess software delivery performance with four consistent metrics. Maybe this is my, my little chaos brain went off and I was like, ooh, metrics, I can play with that. Um, and so I looked at ways that we could incorporate these metrics in an open source context. Um, thanks to Chaos Project, we can actually do that in a, in a more generalized way. I don't have to rattle them off for you. I can just say, here's a cool link, check it out. Um, but the reason why I liked looking at this project is because instead of looking at the quantification of a, a piece of software, it also looks at the quality of it, not just how long it is. Um, and if you're familiar with the concept, assessing software quality through tooling and metrics is really hard to do. Um, this is a generally hard problem. And so I don't want to say that this necessarily solves that problem, but it gives us one idea for quality. And actually, I like in Kaylee's talk yesterday, uh, she mentioned using Pylint as one way to assess quality, looking for other types of security issues in the project. There are other tools like that. So potentially we can use a combination of tools to understand quality and quali qualifications for quality. Um, because if we're looking at something like value, if it's a really crappy thing? Should we really be putting as much value on it as something that's the same size, but is better quality? Um, so I was interested in it as a way, potentially an idea to as associate relative quality between, and maybe even relative quality between software development practices themselves. Um, maybe projects have a more, like a faster delivery time than anything that's happening internally. It just gives you something relative to look at. Um, However, there are, again, some inherent incompatibility issues with this particular assessment method. It is based on assessing the practice of a team at a company. So clearly, if you're looking at open source, we're dealing with heterogeneity in both people, motivation, compensation, incentive, time commitment, and a whole bunch of other things. So not, again, the most perfect thing, but it's an idea that maybe we can learn from. So in summary, um, we looked at Kokomo, we looked at Dora, in these particular cases, there are probably others that if I went down the software development productivity research stream, I probably would have too many. So I kind of had to cap it at a certain point to have an argument. Um, but we still see lines of code as sort of a proxy for some sort of quantitative size. Um, I like the idea of complexity multipliers, but we might have to rethink how to do it. Um, and again, we're, we're kind of not accounting for maintenance or improvement over time. So potentially we need to incorporate that into the model and then potentially considering something like Dora as a way to have relative quality assessment in addition to just quantification. The next set of models I wanna look at are ones around social and social technical models. So 
I think this is the first reference I found to a social technical interaction network applied to open source. I know the researchers in the room can correct me if there was an earlier one, but I tried to find the first one because I thought this was an interesting moment in time to say, hey, we have this thing called social technical interaction networks, which are people, equipment, data, diverse resources, documents, messages, legal, enforcement, resource flows, basically like a bunch of different stuff. But clearly, they're related to each other. Clearly, they're interacting with each other in social, economic, and political ways. So wait, open source kind of can look like that. And so it was this, this kind of realization that the heterogeneity in open source, say, performed by loosely coordinated software developers and contributors, actually can, can look a lot like a social technical model. Um, and so what can we learn from research happening in this space that complies with open source? Now. Going down that space, um, I, I ended up just with more complexity, so I didn't actually follow on the progression. But what I did like was the inspiration for other kinds of complexity variables. Um, I think it's mostly an avenue for further research um, in terms of actually quantifying value out of those things. But I have seen research going down each of these individual avenues in terms of different types of people, the composition of paid versus unpaid, volunteers, um, how we think about diversity, equity, inclusion in these spaces, and how that can how more diverse teams can be more productive. So we are starting to see research in subsets of these spaces. Um, again, covering all of them in one slide was somewhat challenging, so I did not. Um, but I am sort of keeping that in the back of my head as other ways that we can look at um, understanding value from a, a more of a complex lens. Um, I did want to call it one particular one um, just because it speaks to value for the individual uh, was the research done around motivation. Um, and this is a repeat. I think it was actually there was an earlier version of this and they redid it again in 2021. Um, but I love it because it reminds us that many people are just here to learn and to have fun. Uh, I'm thinking about spots talks yesterday, but like Seriously, though, this is a fun space. It's really cool to learn from people, or it's really fun to solve problems. I like thinking about intellectual things and talking about other people to other people that are also interested in those things. So we find a lot of commonality, a lot of inspiration and value working in these spaces as individuals. Um, so even the extended research on social technical models and social models can also start to reveal some of the other types of motivation that could be value drivers for the individual, not necessarily the company in this context. But again, I'm looking at multiple we's. Um, another model that I want to raise, um, by posited by Julia Ferrioli, who I think is somewhere around this conference, and um, we heard her from her this morning, um, was another uh, type of way to look at project intent. So we were thinking about the motivation of the individual, but also thinking about the motivation of the creator. Why did they make this thing? And if we know why they made the thing, then we might be able to have a better sense of how we should value the thing. Because if it's just a demo, then potentially it doesn't have the same weight as something that's designed to be a collaborative tool. Um, potentially, also, I was drawn to this because I am a sucker for a new taxonomy. I think this is the fault of coming from a market research background. It's like, oh, you came up with another way to organize this? Cool. How do I do that? Um, so I am curious if there would be a way to ascribe value and potentially test whether or not these different types of organization principles can affect something like value. Um, in reality, when I've tried to do this in my own analysis, um, I spend a lot of time manually reading through readmes and trying to discover intent. And that was somewhat of a futile effort. Uh, maybe something an LLM could try to do, but I ended up reading a lot of stuff because things are in different formats. They're in different places. They're on websites. They're in blogs. They're in readmes. They're not all in the same place. This ends up being quite a hard problem and did not scale well when I tried it initially. So just fair warning. So what can we learn from this? Uh, I am looking at the broader set of research around social and social technical models as a way to, again, add more complexity levers. We can start with a really high level number, but if we want to really understand what it means or understand what it means for a specific project, then we can start to look at these things in more detail. Because I think, again, I am thinking about both the explicit case and the case at scale, where I in my role at Google, I work with a lot of individual projects and thinking about how they describe their value to the organization. Um, but then I look across our portfolio of projects that we've created and the portfolio of projects that we use. And now we're in the thousands. So a lot of these methods aren't going to scale well in those models. Um, but if we could consider things like creator intent, composition of people, motivation and incentive of those people, the nuances in infrastructure, tooling, equipment, operation, governance models. And now we throw content into the mix now with the possibility of data, documentation, and messaging becoming assets or input into other types of research. That's a whole other kind of value we're not even talking about in this case, but potentially worth mentioning in this talk. Um, 
thinking a little bit more about, because uh, I was thinking a lot about personal uh, values here and individuals and how they value open source. Um, I did go down a slight rabbit hole here, trying to look for research around skill development and learning and potentially value ascribed to that and found a whole bunch of articles in the Bureau of Labor Statistics um, because they were looking at how specific skills and educational environments could suggest your projected outcome and projected, sorry, protected income, um, as well as protected jobs, how many jobs are available in the market, what are they paying? Um, and that's kind of the lens that they were looking at. Wasn't really the kind of value that I was interested in digging into, but again, an interesting tangent. Um, if you if notice anything about my my research style, you can see that I keep making my problem bigger. Uh, so that's why this is still a thought experiment versus a tangible outcome. Um, the next set of models I wanted to go into are business models. And again, because I work at a business and I have to put things into language and frameworks that my management team and beyond can understand. Um, has anyone in the room worked on a total cost of ownership model? Hey, we got a couple. Um, I started my career building these as a consultant uh, for data center investments. Uh, it's actually kind of fun. I don't know. I was think fun thinking about the acquisition costs and the maintenance costs and the replacement costs, the how long did things take to die before you could replace them under warranty. Um, and so you're looking at not just the cost to acquire, but the cost to continually maintain the thing. Um, and when you're looking at the scale of a data center, like clearly we're in the millions over years, um, but in something like software, potentially not the same scale, but it's a helpful framework to think about because especially in open source, when we're thinking about it, we tend to look at the cost savings of acquiring something for free, but not necessarily all the other costs that go into maintaining it inside your organization. Turns out it's not free. Um, I'm, I'm working on a model like this internally that hopefully I can share um, at some point, but basically demonstrating that the cost to maintain inside of our own company in our own context is not free. Why? Maybe some of that is subject to the fact that we use monorepo style, but if we update something, Inside, we'll click, first we have to make sure that there's a compliance component and everything is up to snuff in terms of security and quality. But then maybe we push an upgrade through and we break all of our downstream dependencies inside the company. Now you have to submit how many other uh, proposals or changes because we broke everything else that everyone else was using just because we applied an upgrade. Oh, what about if you added customization and patching to that? So we want to upgrade it. Oh, now you have to redo that again. So this is a non-zero cost, um, in fact, and it might grow over time, again, depending on the context of your own environment. Um, return on investment is probably the most popular thing. Have I tried to do this with open source? I have. Have I succeeded? Maybe. Um, it works a little bit better for individual projects. And I think, again, because there's so much individual like context specific, what does the thing do? What does the thing do inside your company? How are you using it inside your company? Is this the core of your product and you're selling services around it? That might be a simpler model than um, this is a language that we use to build stuff and sometimes we sell those things, but we don't always sell those things. So now it's a lot more complicated because it could apply to three or four different cases. Um, so most of the times that I've tried to do uh, work on an ROI, we've had to focus it on just one project or just one package. And even then it wasn't always a clear argument, especially because when you think about ROI, usually the business wants to see something with money on it. <laughs> How much income did we make from this thing? And you're like, well, we, we made some like good networking connections um, personally, and maybe that's not really the argument they wanna hear. So taking a step back, um, TCO and ROA are gonna be popular models, but note that they're always gonna be organizationally subjective. So if, if we do are able to publish some of these after the fact, you can learn from the inspiration, but you're gonna have to redo it again for your own context. Um, I also don't like the sense that it kind of perpetuates the idea that open source is free as in beer. I, I know I've heard this uh, analogy many times at open source conferences, it's actually free as in puppy. Again, thinking about all those other costs that go into it, you have to actually put stuff back in. You can't just use it and assume it's gonna be free forever. Generally, you're gonna end up spending some kind of money somewhere. Um, so when you do that, we think of it more again like a total cost of ownership as the total investment, um, then you're also considering your internal infrastructure, people, maintenance, integration costs, and probably also community funding at some point over time. Um, again, we talked about the challenges of actually evaluating some kind of net income in that bracket case, what percentage of income is associated with package project work. Um, that's gonna be pretty challenging. Um, so I've seen others look at sort of the percentage of code base that is open source. I mean, I feel like the tide lift model kind of plays on this a bit, how many packages are you using, then we can funnel money back to all the things that you depend on. Um, and so that at least you're looking at it from a portfolio standpoint. Um, this is also my bias here. I, I really don't like seeing 
a number. A number by itself doesn't mean a lot. I want to know how it compares to other numbers and other situations. So if you're thinking about the total cost of ownership of something like open source software as a percentage of your code base, what's about the same ratio for something like proprietary software or purchase software? Um, I think if anything, this again goes back to that motivation I talked at, at the beginning um, about trying to convince your company to put more money into open source communities. Looking at that disparity might turn a lot of heads. Um, looking at, yes, you are a saving money from this, but you're still going to save money from this even if you give some back to the community. And looking at that disparity might help to be able to make that case. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that there are more benefits and more values attributed to using open source software and working in open source software ecosystems. Um, this is taken from a Linux Foundation research report published last year. Um, that was just, again, a survey uh, of companies that were using open source and saying, how are you benefiting from open source? And yes, cost savings are on there, but so are things like being having more independence from vendors or faster development speed or higher security of software. Um, and some of these things can be quantified and others of them can't be. I'm actually surprised to see that innovation is not on here. Um, we were talking about this yesterday. I was with Josh. Um, where I'm not really sure how we would put a dollar value on being able to come up with another kind of solution faster. Difficult to do, but potentially worth mentioning. So there's always going to be some qualitative additions to how you talk about value. Um, it would be great if we had more ways to quantify all these things, because so, I could come up with a number again, um, but it might not be possible. Which brings us to economic models, which I had to come back to, and I, I, I chose this image because I, I wanted to say it was sort of like doing the, the round peg square hole problem where you're just trying to squeeze something in. And if you are something like a gelatinous feline, yes, you can probably squeeze your body into a box. Um, putting open source into economic models may or may not be as successful, but we're going to try anyway. Um, so I started really high level and you might think, why am I talking about GDP? Um, this is a bit of, uh, okay, we're looking at a market valuation of all goods and services. And you're like, okay, cool. What does that, what does that mean? Why do I care? Um, usually this is used at a government level, um, to talk about the overall economy or societal value of a specific thing over time. And actually there's some really problematic attributes around GDP. So I don't want to go too much into that in terms of comparing who's better and what does that actually mean? I not, not don't really love that aspect of it, but I bring it up because we've seen open source applied to GDP. Uh, the EU did this a couple of years ago. They were trying to see how much open source benefited their global domestic product. Um, and they actually came up with a number, which I thought was kind of wild. Um, and so I was really curious to read the methodology and say, how did they do this? Can we learn from what they did? Um, turns out they looked, for, looked at a lot of publicly available values um, and then also ran a massive survey. Um, which I'm like, OK, that's a little disappointing. I was hoping for some sort of quantitative method that I could repeat. I don't quite have the funding to go out and talk to 900 companies in the European Union and ask about them how they're benefiting from open source software. But it's, again, helpful to learn what people have done before in terms of trying to come up with valuations of things like open source. Then we come to supply and demand. And I wanted to start with the definition here. And this shouldn't be new for anyone unless you didn't take Econ 101. Um, but I find that hard to imagine. I feel like most people were forced through that at some point in their collegiate education. Um, but I highlighted all the terminology and the definition that I feel like is fundamentally at odds with something like open source, like coming up with a price for something that is perfectly traded in a perfectly competitive market. So again, there's some awkwardness there where, yes, open source solutions do impact the vendor-based solutions and there is some interaction, but I wouldn't say that it's perfectly competitive. It's something else entirely. Um, and then with the goal to, again, match supply with demand and come up with a price, um, that's probably not the thing we're going for. And yet it's been tried. Um, so we look at the Nagel report that I think I've seen at every conference I've been to. And I unfortunately might be the first person I'm mentioning it who's mentioning at this conference, and I think like that's a ding on me. Um, but I did have to bring it up because I am talking about valuation models, and it is literally called the value of open source software, so we have to talk about it. Um, and, and so what they did is try to equate supply and demand of open source, but I, I kind of rephrased how I read it, because they're looking not necessarily at supply, but at supply as the cost to create. Um, and looking at demand as the cost to replace. If I'm using this open source software, if I wasn't able to do it, I have to write something on my own inside of my company. So that's generally the gist of their model. Clearly there's many other pages um, of how they do this, but um, I just wanted to share the highlights again of what they did to see what we can learn from that and what we can improve upon. 
they do acknowledge again the challenge of it being a non-pecuniary thing um, and having no centralized usage tracking. So some fundamental challenges with even their own model, um, they did use a set of non-public data. So again, hard to repeat, um, but they were able to have some element of usage understanding in order to make these assessments. So what can we learn from this? Um, at the core of it, they define value as software development labor as lines of code. Does that sound familiar to anyone? <laughs> Uh, we're coming back to lines of code. Again, I, I really struggle with this metric. I think I've brought this up in so many other metrics conversations because it is a great way to have a very consistent measure across all software projects. They all have lines of code. We can have relative comparisons of how large they are, but this has nothing to do with how much time has been spent on them. Again, does not include refactoring. Um, and then also now that we've thought about all these other models, we're also missing the other other kinds of value from this. This is only looking at if the value is the software itself. Um, and it also is not really looking at any other kinds of costs that go into the creation of it. There's no maintenance, there's no refactoring, there's no non-code work, which we haven't talked about yet, but it's a large component of larger projects. They're not just software developers writing code in a room with their laptop. Maybe they started that way, but eventually they find themselves doing other kinds of work in order to keep the project progressing, if, if that's their goal. So. This is one way to do it. We've seen maybe Kokomo might actually be a little bit more sophisticated than this. But again, I, I laud them for trying to do this. It's a really hard problem. Um, I, I don't necessarily think that I could have done it better. Um, but because I didn't do it, I can complain about it. Uh, which brings us to potentially my favorite prospect, um, the authors in the room, uh, Kaylee. Um, I've been following this work because I think it kind of takes the concept of supply and demand, but in an open source context recognizes that, again, we're not trying to find price here, but we can look at the relationship of supply and demand to highlight potentially alignment or out of alignment between how much we have worked to create, sorry, how much effort we spend creating a thing versus how many people are using the thing. And so I think this is a wonderful example that we can be inspired from a traditional economic model like supply and demand, but actually put it into a context that makes sense for open source in the open source context. Um, and coming back to the, the business speak here, um, risk is a word that resonates with organizations. Again, maybe they want to put money on it, like how much money are we going to lose if that piece of software goes away, goes down, we need to replace it, or there's a security issue. Um, so there's always sort of a cost or impact associated with risk, but the concept of risk is going to resonate. And so showing that these things are actually at risk um, by a model like the underproduction model can actually be a fairly strong argument to say, make a case for investing in it. Um, I also like this model because instead of just looking at the cost to create the thing, it also considers the ongoing maintenance of the thing. Um, and so this is a little bit more sophisticated way of acknowledging how much work it takes to maintain the thing over time, not just to create the thing um, at its onset. And again, this is also tailored to open source um, and does acknowledge that this is built by people that don't always come from the same background, the same motivation, or have the same priorities and time commitments. Um, the similarities are we do again see demand as usage. Um, which is helpful in this context in terms of creating this model. Um, maybe we don't care as much about demand actually in the context of a business because I actually know that already. Uh, maybe this is the fun part about working with data around a monorepo, but I know all the things we use and I know how much we use them and I know how many teams use them. So I don't actually need to know demand as much in my own context because I have my own contextual demand. Um, but then I might use something like this to showcase if we have potential risks around the things that we depend on. So what can we learn from these models? GDP, we probably don't care, or at least the people in this room, it's less, very less applicable to me. Maybe if you're working for a government and you're trying to convince them to invest in critical infrastructure, maybe this is a more compelling argument, maybe not. Um, but supply and demand, maybe if we continue to add on what is counted in supply, not just the creation, but also the maintenance, and potentially other types of work, not just software development work that goes into creating it. If we continue to look at demand as, okay, I what would it take to replace this thing? Um, ensure that you're using cost of use. Now I'm kind of combining my thinking again here, seeing a little bit of the TCO language coming into this. Um, but we are missing, again, those consistent measures of demand if you want to do this from a societal level or a general level in the ecosystem. Um, this is a problem that I've been thinking about for a while um, because there isn't a great way to measure demand or usage of an open source project. Um, so last year, I worked on a project with Garrick Link in the chaos community where it started as a thought experiment of, in chaos, we look at all these other metrics about a project and they're typically trying to understand project and community health or contributor behavior but it turns out a lot of your users are also going to be in that data or reflected in that data in some way so we started with a blog first just 
with a hypothesis that there is some information about our users in this extended metrics or proxy metrics describing the interactions around our project. Um, and then last year, we were able to actually test this. Um, we found a project, Flutter, that did collect telemetry, and we compared their actual usage statistics with some of these proxy metrics to see which ones actually were strong, more strongly correlated to actual usage trends. Um, we found maybe surprisingly that it was stars and forks. Um, stars potentially surprising because I generally think of them as a vanity metric, but strong correlation. Um, but forks actually had the strongest correlation as well as over time. Granted, it was off by orders of magnitude, so it was not a good number to quantify, but it did give us some in insight into the trend of usage. Um, I will stress that this was a case study. So one example, this is not necessarily a real thing. We would love to repeat the experiment, see if we can find similar trends um, in other projects. There's just the inherent challenge where most projects don't collect telemetry. So we're not really sure if we're going to be able to progress this research. We would like to try because I think it could solve an open problem. Um, but again, we don't just we don't have enough data right now. So we'll see how that goes. Maybe I'll have something new to share next year. Um, what is missing? Is there something coming around the corner that we just haven't thought about yet? Um, we talked a little bit about how how to count non-code contribution. Um, I've seen some research um, here. I know Anita Sarma, who's not here uh, in, or in Oregon State, has been pursuing a, a number of these topics. Um, this is an older piece, uh, What Contributions Count, which actively looked at trying to find other kinds of contributors that weren't just writing code or reflected in the code commit stream um, and seeing what types of artifacts they could find traces of these other types of contributors. So they were able to demonstrate that they actively found people working on the project that were not listed anywhere else in the trace data. Um, but we still don't generally have a sense of how much other work is required. Um, so I'd be curious to see if folks are working on that. I did hear a number thrown out at another conference, but I don't know where it came from, so I'm not going to repeat it. Um, but saying that you could think about it as some sort of multiplier. If we have X number of people working on software development, then we need Y percentage of additional support. Um, it would be really cool if we could say that. Uh, I can't currently. So in the meantime, we're looking at other ways that we can find traces of non-code work to better understand it, better recognize it, and attribute value around it. Um, I have other pie in the sky ideas that are entirely conceptual and I have no data on them, but I feel like they have some value to them. Is when we think about open source, um, there's always the concept of many people work on one thing and we all get the benefit of the thing. So in theory, if we think about it like an ROI, I've invested X hours in it and I get Y hours back um, in terms of value. Um, granted, there's probably some sort of diminishing returns problem here if you have too many cooks in the kitchen and suddenly your project goes nowhere. Uh, so clearly, there may or may not be a continual growing benefit from something like this or a model like this. But I would love to see someone try to prove this from a quantitative fashion. Um, I attempted to do this once, and it didn't make any sense. Um, and then I got another project that I actually had to do, and so I didn't pursue it. Um, see, so there's a little bit of a trend here. Uh, <laughs> The other thought I've had is sort of really hypothetical that I would love to be able to show with numbers, but again, it intrinsically makes sense in some cases, which is, is there any way that we can show that working or using open source software and working in open source communities can impact your future technical debt um, because you're working in a cooperative system evolution, as in we are evolving together versus you're working on your own thing by yourself and then five years later, we're all in a different framework and if you want to use any of those toolings, you have to adopt the new thing and you have to change direction. But in theory, if we were all working on these concepts together and evolving our standards together, that should help to minimize this effect. Right? Maybe? Again, theory. Not proved. Um, just curious. Um, but this is the, the, I don't know how many, much time I have, but I was going to say, this is my, my phone a friend slide. Um, I consider you all my friends here. 10 minutes. Um, where I'm open to questions, but I'm also open to more ideas. If you read a piece of research that you think I would be interested in in this line of thinking, again, this is very much a project in flight. Um, I'm looking for more examples. I'm looking for more research, more hypothetical case studies or real case studies. Um, and with that being said, I'm going to stop talking and see if there are any thoughts in the room or questions. Of them are motivated, but it seems like they're on the path to quantify it. I guess the question is, then again, we get into you know, how much 
stopped and be like, I mean, I guess we can't do anything for them or whatever. Mm-hmm. But then also saying, like, well, it would be important enough to them that they would be more clear of their position and their beliefs. I think we are almost at the point where we have enough examples to dig into that. Um, yeah. It does feel like that, except for when you look at there's a piece of research that came out at XC this year, uh, or it was actually MSR, um, that was looking at licensing trends, looking across all package repositories. Um, and they actually, I think I want to say like only 8% of packages had changed licenses across the entire thing. So it's actually pretty small, but there's been so many prominent examples that have huge market value associated with them that clearly, I, I think there is there is opportunity to dig in there. So I do agree with that. Thank you for suggesting it. Ah, uh, I don't know who was first. <laughs> yeah, and kind of building on that a little bit, sort of related to things that we're talking about, like how people operate software and their own software and others, mm-hmm. and you're operating on house and you're taking things from cloud offerings. Yeah. Um, and then that cost of operating is something that we can dive into and talk about more in the talk about the next time. I agree. Yeah, I, I've looked at it from a very like self serving construct where we in our cross our portfolio of consumed open source packages, different teams have different philosophies about how they interact with it in terms of like, we're always going to run on the latest version, or we're not going to allow any patching or customization so that we can run on the latest version at any point in time, or we're just going to fork this into something else, Franken-Monster internally, that eventually there's one package, I, I won't say what it is because that's probably revealing something proprietary, but it takes this guy like six months to update, which is like a little terrifying. If someone's whole job is just to update this widely used software package because we put so much customization into it. That is a huge operational cost um, versus just benefiting from the upstream package. So uh, that's like the the lens that I've looked at it in, but I think there are other variations of operational models that maybe if we were more rigid in how we classify them, we could see more trend and more ability to have a standard approach. So I, I do agree with that as well. Thank you. And then you, Josh. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've, I've looked at it in surveys, um, but not necessarily in a more quantitative fashion. Surveys are very subjective, um, but we were looking at it from the point of like, skill qualification of companies. So there's been some surveys that have looked at skill prerequisites. I know I think the Linux Foundation runs one every year that sort of looks at open source skills and how much that's like factoring into their own hiring decisions. Um, I've looked at it in terms of whether or not that like helped an individual find a job. And we've looked at also whether or not the company was looking for that in it. But these are all surveys, so they're a little harder to generalize, um, as well as looking at sort of an aggregate impact um, versus the impact on an individual or an individual company. So I think those the latter two are a little bit easier to address versus something at society at large. But I'm actually just coming out of the FOSS education track, I was thinking about that as well, um, where we were seeing examples in sugar labs of individuals that were learning through doing and through open source in ways that that was, I didn't have any computers when I was in middle school. <laughs> like that was not the experience I had. I had a book, I had a teacher, and uh, now like an environment where you potentially could co-create the course environment, that is an entirely different structure and method of learning that must have some kind of impact and value. So um, I haven't necessarily seen research on that exactly, um, but I'd be curious. Yeah. Josh? Um, well, so one of the things I'm wondering about this is what models the companies be, do companies have models for how much proprietary software is worth to them beyond GCN? I mean, my experience is no, but that might be <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I've seen it in terms of operational cost, um, in terms of like how many people you need to maintain a thing and how many people do you really need to maintain a thing and can we reduce that? Um, <laughs> mm-hmm. 
I've done that as a consultant. Um, and so I don't know how much is happening inside of companies, um, but like the bill versus buy uh, yeah. or socially initiating different types of vendors. Um, so at least that was my experience is we would hire companies to do that for us instead of doing it internally or someone like myself who would do it for a data center. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think that could be better. Um, and I think that also potentially could give us, like if companies did that more, they would have a better understanding of how much value they were getting from open source as well. Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, I think this is one of the, the faults of even publicly traded companies are not that fine grained in their reporting, but we could look at operational costs and cost of labor. But then again, there's always the like, I've, I was trying to find out how many per, like percentage of an average, average workforce goes into software development versus other fields. Um, also as a way to think about non-code contribution Potential ratios, if we look at a, a company that's a software development company, we can look at all the other infrastructure costs, people, tooling, stuff that goes into it that's not a software development cost to get a better sense of what that ratio is. And I still think it's as low as 20% for IT companies, except for, I think the, the survey that I was looking at was calling everyone an IT company, which made me kind of suspect. Uh, so um, I'm not really sure. I didn't want to put it on the screen because I was like, I don't trust this. But um, I have been looking into that and I haven't found a good, I haven't found a good answer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, comparison of non trade <laughs> Well, thank you for looking into that. Yeah, uh, I still would like to read that, though. I love to see when people fail, too. We can learn from that. Interesting. Is that something that was ever shared publicly? No. <laughs> I, I would. Yeah, I, I wish we were allowed to share these things. I mean, this is the the strain between working for a large corporation and the joy that I get working in open source, where I can talk about my half baked ideas because they are not sensitive. Um, but there are many things that are like the actual ROI numbers that you might have for specific kind of activities. Uh, one more in the back. Thank you for that. Um, this is the last slide I have, which is really where I'm at right now, just because I wanted to share how I've been trying to put all these things together. Um, you can see that there is very low organization here and a lot of big red circles where I still really don't know how to best address that. Um, so I can either work on something that's really reductive um, and only parts of this, or um, still try to find ways to quantify some of these other things. Um, and we'll probably end up with something in the middle. Um, but thank you so much for your time. Uh, and 